Cool. Looks like we are live recording. Um, some folks are jumping in down at the bottom. We're constantly seeing that number increase, so that's good. Uh, we'll give it a few minutes here just to let some folks jump in before we really kick this thing off. But in the meantime, Cody, uh, Elk Week, it's here. It's happening as we speak live. What uh, What is Elk Week? What is that all about? What do you guys got going on? One thing I do want to caveat with this, though, is you're probably going to talk about some cool things for this week. Um, people will be watching this on YouTube after the fact. So, um, you know, these things may or may not be available still, but I'm sure some of that content that you guys are putting out right now will still be accessible. So yep, what's, sure. what's Elk Week? Well, you know, it's like every year, 4th of July, like the calendar hits and it's like, oh my gosh, elk season is around the corner. And so like we kind of hit that fast forward mode uh, as we're getting into season. And last year we started it. We kind of, I'll, I'll say we took some inspiration of uh, Discovery Channel and, and Shark Week. And it's like, let's just do a week dedicated about elk. And uh, it's pretty cool. Like last night's video was straight up action packed, 20 kills, 20 minutes, um, kind of some of the best of the best over the years. Um, and then we have a meat care video tonight that's like forced to fork. So from field processing to at home processing all the way into your freezer. Uh, tomorrow we have EXO, uh, Steve Speck came into studio. We did a gear dump. Basically it's like, you wanna go back country elk hunting. Here's kind of the rundown, how the thought process, the gear list, all of that side of it, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we go into an elk calling. Uh, so more of this style, uh, a little bit of information here. Friday night is the Brotherhood film release, which we did at Portland. You, you were there, um, but now yep, that was awesome. Go worldwide with it, uh, which will be really cool. Kind of a, a glimpse into us and who we are and why, what the brotherhood that we've built over the years, the bonds that are made on the mountain and forged. And then uh, on Saturday, we actually did a call to action last year and had viewer submitted videos. And so we got three videos going up that uh, we selected out of the deal. So if you're a, a new filmmaker, have an interest in it, um, grab a camera, record what's going on this year. And uh, you can you can check out the information on our website and get you know submitted by uh, May 1 next year. And, uh, and all this is going on every night. We have new winners, we're giving away prizes. Today we give away a Hoyt bow. Tomorrow is a made by meat grinder, uh, Onyx, uh, elite membership later in the week. So just a full stack of stuff. Pretty excited about. Awesome. Yeah, it does. It seems like a, a switch flips around that early July, right after the fourth. It's like, okay, it's, it's here. I know it hit me a couple of weeks ago. Honestly, I was, somebody had mentioned um, first week of September and I opened my calendar on my phone and I swiped two times and September was there. I was like, holy cow. So like it's, it's here. It's uh it's an exciting time of the year. I'm, I'm getting the itch for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm every year it's like panic sets in for me because it's we got a lot going on in the business and the call side and make, making stuff and then it's like, holy cow, we got we got a get her button gear I I've been hiking but I have not been shooting so I'm behind the, the eight ball there but um, I'm real complete trusty. opposite from you I've, I've been shooting a bunch, um, but I've done zero hiking so between the two of us, one of us can hike to them and the other one can shoot. There you go. Yeah. Um, well, cool. I'll, uh, I know you don't need much or born and raised as a whole doesn't need much of an introduction whatsoever, but um, why don't you give us a super brief introduction on yourself, Cody, uh, born and raised as a whole, like high, high level cliff notes, and then we'll, we'll dive in and get to some calling stuff. Yeah. So I appreciate Dylan for inviting us on here. Onyx has been a huge partner for us um, really from the inception. We started in 2007, uh, started making DVDs, had a TV show, and went to YouTube in 2017 and uh, kind of our showcase product or showcase content was land of the free series. We, we, the inaugural year was 2017 and we traveled around for 50 days, filmed a day by day and, and shot elk in five states. So it was, it was a pretty cool project. It really kind of catapulted us to, to where we are today. Um, we started a call company in 2021 and uh, now manufacture our own elk calls, waterfowl calls, turkey calls. Um, we've got some other manufacturing and meat bags and uh, some more stuff here on, on the docket in 23 and 24. But uh, yeah, just we love, basically our, our mission is to entertain, educate, and inspire, um, creating content through that. And then, you know, making products to make hunters better is, is really the mission for us. Um, we 
we like to do it ourselves. Um, you know, OTC stuff is kind of our bread and butter. And uh, if the draw gods are with us, you know, hopefully we can get some good <laughs> tags here and there. But um, yeah, no, and we just were based in Oregon, Western Oregon, grew up hunting Roosevelt's, um, branched out and started hunting Rocky Bowls in 2012, I think it was, and found some success in our strategies and the crossover of what, what we do, you know, here growing up, uh, cat road shuffle, covering a lot of ground and bugling and, and using the calls. And I'm really a, a guy like, if there's any species to hunt and I can call, like I am in to go do that. So whether that's waterfowl, turkeys, elk, um, you know, are definitely my, my top three, so. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm, I'm excited for tonight. I know for me personally, just watching your guys' uh, even the old school DVDs with the, you know, the face painted up and I still have a stack of those in my closet all the way to today. Like a lot of my personal success is because of emulating what you guys have done, not only on your videos and then been fortunate enough to hunt with you guys and hang out with you guys a little bit and just, uh, yeah. So I'm really excited to uh, kick this thing off and then also sit back and listen and pick up a bunch of tips and tricks for myself as well. So um, I'm going to share my screen over, want to just go through a couple of uh, super, super quick details. Um, as a reminder, everybody's screens are off. We can't see your video. We can't hear your audio. So don't worry about that. Um, the Q&A. So at the bottom, there's a chat and there's a Q&A function. Go ahead, use that chat. Let us know. I've seen a lot of people letting us know where they're tuning in from. Um, go ahead, use that chat to chat amongst yourselves. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Use the Q&A function, though, for questions you actually want us to get to at the end. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll try and summarize the best we can and then hit the questions that weren't addressed or answered during this presentation. So a lot of them are going to get hit, but use that Q&A for questions you actually want us to, to take a look at at the end. So um, the other thing, I mentioned this in the beginning, but if you're watching this after it is live on YouTube, uh, the giveaway is closed. Sorry, you missed out. Uh, the Elk Week stuff, the giveaway, you know, check all that stuff out. We still are, have, you know, three days left in the week. Uh, make sure you're going over to Born and Raised and checking that stuff out. But if you're watching this on YouTube, you know, a week from now, two weeks from now, a year or two from now, obviously that stuff is closed. So um, last note, if you have any personal uh, mapping questions, app questions, account issues, password reset, that type of stuff, email help at onxmaps.com, not the Q&A below. Um, we've got a really good support team that will take care of you guys within the next day or so. So uh, make sure that you're emailing us and not throwing those in the chat or the, the Q&A. So obviously tonight um, we've got out calling strategies with born and raised outdoors. We've got, got Cody. He just, um, you know, told you a little bit about himself and born and raised as a whole. If you haven't heard of born and raised, you you live under a rock, just YouTube born and raised outdoors. You'll find all the cool elk content you'll ever need. Um, and then some other really cool stuff as well. So with that, I'm going to kind of kick this over to Cody. Cody, do you have anything on this first slide here, just the uh, high level or just dive right into the next one? No, I know uh, just on the, on the, Trent was uh, bummed out and he couldn't make it, but he's celebrating his 20th year anniversary with his wife this week on a trip. So I uh, just wanted to give a shout out to Trent and uh, yeah, just uh, let's dive in on yeah. talking elk hunting. Cool. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Cody for most of this. He's the expert. Um, we're going to run you through a whole bunch of stuff. And then at the end, we've got some cool giveaway stuff, some really cool things that we are working on that Onyx is working on with Born and Raised Outdoors. Um, so definitely stay tuned till the very end to get some sneak peeks on what's coming, get some cool uh, exclusive discount opportunity and then some giveaway stuff. So um, with that, Cody, I'll kick it over to you. Sweet. Good. And I uh, hit that slideshow there, Dylan. And we'll, uh... Copy. Are we, so you must not be seeing the slideshow. Uh, Is that correct? I see just a screen show, screenshot. Yeah. Let's see. So are you seeing like the cat road shuffle option here? No, right now it's still your whole okay. web browser that I'm seeing. Let me stop sharing and let me try that again here. Share screen, sorry for the technical difficulties. Let's see. 
There we go. What about now? Yep. Got it? Got it. Cool. Yep. Perfect. So, so we will kick it off um, with this first one here. Perfect. Um, so the biggest thing uh, we use for, for elk hunting, our tools of the trade is going to be calling. Um, and we kind of start with just the basic side of it. Um, you know, and there's basically breaks into three categories. Um, we use diaphragm call or a mouth call, bugle tube, and a, an estrus external call. Um, and, and the big thing there is finding one that you're comfortable. There's a lot of really good manufacturers. There's a lot of variables. Um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I can't use it. My, no my mouth is a narrow palate or it's a wide palate or I have a latex alert, uh, allergy. Um, to try to find one that you, you like. Um, and if you find one you like, buy multiples of it. That's just one of those you're, you're bound to lose. Lose one when you're out there in the woods or have it fall out of your pocket and get a pine needle stuck through it or something like that. So they're pretty cheap and indispensable. Um, if you don't have one, that's you know that gonna be the challenge. But for calling, um, the big thing uh, kind of show basically um, for the uh, frame side of it, you know, we have, it's called the arc frame. Um, it's a dome call, it's all aluminum. Um, and then the big differences on calls, it's gonna be what the latex thickness and stretch is. And the thicker the latex and the tighter the stretch, the harder it is going to be to blow, but it's going to be louder um, and you can get more volume out of it. And you have, once you figure it out, you can get a little bit more control. Um, a thinner latex like our Easy Cow and a light pressure um, is going to take less air. You can get the initial sound out of it. And, um, you know, but most any read, you can make a cow call with it. You can bugle with it. You can uh, lip ball, chuckle, all that. It's just going to be um, how it comes from your diaphragm. And, um, you know, the big, I'll just do a quick, you know, how do you get a sound out of a diaphragm? Um, you're going to have, you know, where the, the arc frame is going to be up in the roof of your mouth. You don't want to put it back too far. And I actually run, kind of run mine forward. Um, but you're going to blow, instead of, think about um, fogging glasses versus blowing a candle out. You're going to blow air from your diaphragm. So you're going to get that versus and that that it's a pressure scenario um, and then you're going to slowly bring your you have your tongue up on the roof of your mouth it's going to close off the air to the latex and then as you drop your jaw or lower that tongue you're going to get a buzz of the reeds that sound like this <laughs> to increase the pressure of that that's how you get that cow sound and it's a You can kind of get that exaggerated noise out of it, but it's, you're going to drop your jaw and it's going to get that high to low sound of it. Um, the cool thing, like I said, once you master a cow sound, that's kind of the building block to make a bugle, to make a chuckle, to make a bark. Um, so um, it's, it's really kind of the tools to start you learning how to elk call. Um, to, to make that bugle sound, you're just going to make this longer and slower. So to get the sound of a bugle, and as you introduce, you know, the next step is a tube that's going to amplify the sound and increase, and you can increase the volume and pressure on that. Um, so um, onto a bugle tube. Lots of things on the market. I like to have a bugle tube where I'm using a mouth call and um, have, uh, you, I, I feel like you have more control. There's a lot of really good, good uh, calls out there that are just a mouthpiece that's going to be in a bugle tube. Um, it's a little bit more user friendly, but I'd encourage you to really challenge yourself. If you've struggled with mouth, mouth calls in the past, take the time, try to practice, get, get the sounds out of it, because in the woods, it's going to translate to success on, you know, the better that you can call. I did see one came up about how long do you expect calls to last. Um, I actually ran this all of September last year and it's still going good. It looks pretty ragged, but, and it's definitely a lower volume because as the reed stretches out, um, it, you'll have issues where you can't get uh, control out of it as much. It's just gonna be a little bit flatter call, but um, I'd encourage you to have a storage case. We've got a call pouch, things stay in. You don't wanna, the last thing you wanna do is throw this up on the dash of your truck have direct sunlight, um, you're going to get it to crack out, it's going to dry out. Um, 
or don't put it back into plastic that can't breathe because that's when we're going to get mold or and have some issues there for, for latex or prophylactic calls. Um, on a bugle tube, the big thing is getting sound. So I use, um, you know, we, we like to, with a locate bugle, it's, you're just trying to get sound out and travel. You're using that bugle to cover all the terrain. What, you know, with your own onyx, you're gonna pick a main ridge. It's got a bunch of finger ridges off of it. And you're gonna, you know, travel, use that. You wanna be as efficient as possible with your boot steps. Um, so what I'll do for a lip or locate bugle, I actually really have over the years, instead of getting just a high tone, I, I, we call it the two-tone bugle. And you think about a train horn and that low sound, the low sound travels really far and we've we've on the coast here in Oregon really figured out that sometimes those bulls may hear a high note, but they just catch parts of it. And if you give them that lower note, they'll respond to it because they can hear it better. So what a two tone bugle will sound like is like this. You're going to start with a low and then just bump up one octave. And uh, so that that's you can hear that note change and when you're in the woods, you can hear like you'll hear that high note reflect back, but that low note will just keep on carrying and uh, it's a really good note to practice. It's a very uh, uh, shockingly how loud you can get with it, that low note. So um, on the bugle, the next thing that I'll talk about is a lip ball. So lip ball is going to you're going to incorporate the uh, buzz of your lips. And, and if I skipped ahead too fast on cow call to bugle, um, like I said, put some time in, have a read in your truck when you're traveling um, and, and put in some time to practice. But a lip ball is basically, you're gonna purse your lips together. So if you played a trumpet back in middle school, it's the same kind of And when I bring the tube in, this is what it's gonna sound. So that's without a reed in your mouth. So I'll bring a reed sound in and you'll get that uh, higher uh, note buzz and you'll get that realistic um, volume or sound of a bowl. And all I'm doing right there is just buzzing my lips. I'm not adding any voice to that. And uh, when you bring that into a bugle, that's uh, it will later incorporate in the challenge bugle, but you add some realism to it. Um, the chuckle, now this is what separates, I think in elk calling, like the, the experts, the, the realism um, to, and, and I'm always working on this, I'm always trying to improve, but uh, a chuckle, um, the biggest thing that I've learned over the years is bringing air in and out. And you're you're using that diaphragm. If you ever watch a bull bugle on video and you see his his belly is just going in and out, in and out, in and out, chuckling, that's what he's doing. He's exchanging air in and out. And if you're doing a chuckle right, you should be able to continue that chuckle for quite a little while. Um, the wrong way of doing it is where you're just letting air out only and you go hoo, 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 and you run out of air after two or three. The cadence gets off, it's really fast, it's not quite realistic. So, um, you know, bringing that chuckle in, getting that air exchange, this is what that's going to sound like. And I don't know if you can hear my, my, the sound of my diaphragm, but you get that going, going in and out. And uh, you're, you're basically, um, you're taking that tongue pressure up, letting it off. And then as you're letting it off, you're bringing air back in. So you'll get a little buzz of the reed as that's coming in and out. And uh, it's a little tricky to figure out. Uh, definitely the one is uh, you can get. And, you know, and the other way I've learned on the chuckle side of it, you can drop your jaw and you can get that. Basically, you can have that low note of the two tone incorporated into it. And you can add a little uh, your voice, but definitely. Um, bring in, drop your jaw, and that will uh, lower that sound of the chuckle. Um, challenge bugle, this is, you know, incorporated in the, in the, this is where you're going to kind of put it all together. You're going to have a bugle, you're going to have the lip ball, have that chuckle, 
Um, and that's, you know, when you're calling a bull, we'll talk later on on this, but uh, it definitely, uh, you, you bring the emotion into it when you're calling. Locate bugle, you're just, you're covering sound, you're getting sound out there. When you have that challenge bugle, that's when you really bring the emotion into calling. And, and we'll kind of talk about that. That's really key to calling. You can put all these sounds together, but if you're not acting on that bull's emotions or you're not invigorating those emotions, that's when you um, have the challenge of, uh, you know, not you, you sound like a caller or human versus the, that elk. So a challenge bugle is going to sound like this. Um, and hopefully it sounds good. We, we had a little technical challenge of trying to get the zoom dialed in for audio. Um, hopefully this is coming across good to you guys. And uh, yeah, so, and then the next up is gonna be the bark scream. Bark scream is a sound that I've really kind of keyed in and it's, it's one of the, you don't use it hardly ever, but when you do use it, it's in critical moments calling out. Um, say a bull comes in and he sees you and he stops in his track, but he doesn't know what you are turns and walks off, you know, sometimes you'll hear them and they'll bark or they'll hang up and they're like 40 yards, but they're just, just out of the cover. And they're like, I should see an elk from where that sounds coming. And they'll stand there and bark. And I've only been able to use this, uh, Colin, a few times on bulls, but that bark scream, um, particularly I had it in, in a bull in New Mexico. He came in, I had came to full draw and he stood just out of my shooting lane for a couple minutes. And by the time he finally walked in, I couldn't even hold my bow up. And I let down, bull took off, and he went up on the ridge. He didn't know what it was. He just saw some movement, and he stood up there and barked. And I immediately barked, screamed down, or barked, chuckled. And it's like, nope, I'm a bull. I'm right here. And he turned and came right back down the hill. And what a bark is going to be is an exaggerated chuckle, sharper note. And it's going to sound like this. <coughs> now, you don't want to just incorporate that bull bark by itself because that's going to be either an alarm or uh, it's when you kind of incorporate that bark scream to it and that's where you're going to bark and then have that emotion behind it. <coughs> and a lot of times too they'll do a bark chuckle and it's going to be a real fast chuckle. <coughs> So that's kind of the sounds that a tube and a diaphragm can make. The next one up is talking about um, estrus, external calls. Um, there's comment here about the bark is a head alert. That's definitely, an, uh, if it's by itself, is an alert call. But when calling and, and having that, the what I've understood in the communication and seen work with those elk is it's show yourself. It's the challenge, like I should see that sound and if, if they incorporate that bark scream, do it back at them, bark chuckle, and it's like, nope, I'm right here. And that's, you know, a lot of times we'll down engage. Um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll interject real quick on that. I had that work too. Like I've, I've seen bulls like demeanor be, you know, on high alert and then you do that back and just kind of like mellows out the mood is, is what I've seen as well. So I've seen that firsthand and I, it's something I picked up from you guys. And at that point, if, if he's already barked or even if a cow's barked or anything, like, what do you really have to lose? You know, throw that out there and, and see if it calms them down. Yep. So, yeah, I, I like that. The, the one other thing I want to point out, too, is um, back to your point of, you know, keeping a, a diaphragm in your pickup. That was me. Like, I was one of those guys up until probably four years ago. Every time I'd throw one of these in my mouth, I would just gag and I could barely make a sound out of it. Finally, I just got so frustrated that I left one in my pickup all summer. And once you get the hang of it, like it's, it's like a snowball effect. It took me months to like, okay, now I can make a sound, but it sounds horrible. And then all of a sudden, you know, I'll accidentally almost make a cow call and I'm like, ah, oh, it doesn't sound too bad. And then you just pick up on that and that. So I, uh, I just want to reiterate as somebody who really struggled with them, you know, once you do get the hang of it, now it's like, you can throw any of them in and you're good to go. But just uh, just takes a little time and those uh, trips back and forth to work and home seemed like it was what what it took for me anyways. Yeah, and there's actually a real good comment on from Darren. Um, 
he talks about trimming the tape. You know, this is a half inch wide frame. It's um, basically, an, it's, it's not a mini frame, but it's a standard narrow frame that's on the market. But if you have problems and you're getting air past, play around the position of that reed in your mouth, um, sliding it forward. When I first learned how to call, I had this thing slid all the way down to the base of my teeth real low because I had a gag reflex. I just could, you know, and, um, and I'm learning you can also move your tongue back and, and reposition that. Um, but you can trim the tape and it'll, it'll help seal that uh, down. So you won't get, if you're making air noise past your reed, try to tr trim that and see if that helps at all. And start small, a little, little tiny, tiny adjustment can make a lot, lot of difference there. Uh, um, ester, uh, estrus external, this is one um, we use a lot too to locate. Um, we'll use in it, this estrus call. It's a good so cow sound. It travels really far. Um, and so the sounds out of it, you can get a cow sound, you get a calf sound, and then you get an estrus. Um, this one, this is our sound bite. It's one I use. It's an all acrylic. We took the basis of design of actually our duck waterfowl calls. Um, so it's a very hard, dense material versus like an injected call that's a lot out there. And then it's a J frame. You can see the design of this. It's actually set up just like a duck call on a J frame design. And it, what happens then is it pushes the sound out of the back of the chamber versus just off the uh, soundboard. So you get more volume and get a little bit more control. This is what a cow sounds on, on it. As you can see, I prefer personally, I put my lip on it and place it reed down. A lot of people use their teeth, use reed up. Um, it's whatever's comfortable, whatever you get the sound out of it. Um, and I take the band off of it so I can get more tonal range out of it. Now, if you're gonna do a calf sound, you're just gonna slide your lip up and you're gonna get a little bit less reed exposed and that's gonna make a higher pitch. And that's that calf sound. Now, the next side of this is gonna get that estrus whine. That's where, you know, a bull is hearing that estrus sound. You're gonna get, I've heard some crazy cows in the woods that I'm like, was that a cougar scream or what? And sure enough, it was a, it was a cow on estrus. Um, and you're gonna get that whine. And that's basically, you're gonna start with a high, rotate that call in your mouth. You're gonna get a little bit lower and you'll get that buzz of the reed. So it'll sound like this. You get that kind of that wine sound to it. Um, we're working on another call that's going to come to market. It'll be pretty cool that if you struggle with a mouth call to make a cow sound, you struggle with externals. Um, there's a, a call that we're coming that'll uh, be pretty awesome for someone that, well, I honestly, I'll use it more than all the calls combined for cows personally. But if, you, if you've struggled in the past making good cow sounds, we got a solution coming out for you. So stay tuned on that one. That's awesome. And too, like just uh, I'll, I'll move forward here, but just the consistency too, because like it's easy sitting in your home to make, you know, beautiful sound, sounding cow noises out of those for me. And then once in a while, you know, you'll maybe you just hiked up 800 feet to, to try and get in front of a herd and your mouth is dry and there's a bull in front of you and you're, you know, your legs shaking and then I'll go to grab it. And what comes out of it? I'm like, I've made a thousand good cow sounds out of this call. And then when, when it really mattered, like I screwed it up. Um, so to, to yeah. hear that you guys have one coming out is super cool. Yeah. And, and one trip uh, tip I'd want to talk through too on this. Um, if you get a lot of saliva in here, if you got chapstick on, you get something gummed up, take a dollar bill and slide it underneath the reed and that'll clean that moisture out. It'll clean any of that, um, any kind of debris. And you can also take a piece of, well, when this leaves the factory, when we tune them, we take an emery board and we go not uh, perpendicular or we go perpendicular to the soundboard and rough that surface up. So then it has less chance of where that it's going to vapor lock out and stick, you know, and, and people you'll hear this. No, I don't know if I can make it stick, but And a lot of times too, you're putting too much air too fast. Um, and you're too far up on the reed, so it doesn't, the reed doesn't have a chance to vibrate and it's just going to go into the lock mode. So um, that's something to, to look at. So, 
All right, cat road shuffle. If you hear, if you watch this, talk about doing the shuffle. For us, um, Onyx is key on this. We try to, you know, as we come into terrain, we're going to dissect and try to figure out best how to project our sound and, and cover the most terrain that we can, the most efficiently we can. So whether that's elevation, um, you know, whether it's thick timber or open country, all that goes for, um, we're going to do the cat road shuffle. Like here on the Oregon coast, most of it's all old logging roads. It's not a lot, there's not a lot of roadless wilderness type terrain here. So that's how we call it. We just get on the cat road, start hiking. It's the old logging roads where they took the old cat and hauled the logs out of and started covering ground. Um, I talked about this early on, a high note bugle versus a two-tone. Um, a lot of times how we start out, um, I basically, if I come up to an area I'm gonna call into, I'm just gonna come up. You never know how close an elk is. I'll make a couple soft cow calls. Listen, bring the esters call in, get a little bit louder. The other thing too, you can take that call, stick it in your bugle tube. Gets a little bit louder. So I don't know if you can tell the, the volume difference, but it's substantially louder and you can kind of direct that sound. Um, and then that's where I'm going to go. I'll just start out with a soft bugle. Get a little bit louder on the next one. And I'm not getting loud and aggressive in the aggressive side of it, adding a lot of voice. I'm just getting that sound out and then we'll go into a two tone. And like I said, that, that train noise, when you can get, and this is, it's one that's taken me, and I'm still a little inconsistent at times, but getting that low note really cuts that, uh, cuts that, carries that sound out. So um, the next thing is like boot miles versus road miles. We'll, uh, you know, mountain bike hunting, try to find an area that you can be most efficient in covering ground. If you get locked in, you're, you go on a backcountry trip, you're in there seven miles and you're like, okay, this is where camp is. And then you're surrounded in a box Canyon and you can't, you got to climb 3000 feet to get out of there. It's like, you kind of dealt with the hands of what's in that basin. Try to find areas where you can, you know, maybe be up on that top of that Ridge and you can duck out of the weather if you need to, you know, at nighttime and out of the wind, but where you can sound check three or four different drainages. Um, so it's key for Onyx. Like when I go into an area, I've got kind of marked out like the path of, of how I'm going into. I'm not just gonna set up and go on a straight line. I'm gonna kind of dissect the terrain, figure out how I can get sound into each little draw. And we also get the question, how often do, are we calling? Uh, it all depends on the density and thickness of that terrain, the, the, the trees and all that. Um, here on the coast, a lot of times it's every couple, two, three, 400 yards, um, you know, over east. It might be, um, you know, hunting Rockies, it might be, 500 or 1000 yards between calling because it's like open bass country and your sound's going to cover further. So it's just one to um, if you're, you know, say three quarters of the uh, mountain high is I, I like to be high. I don't want to be down in the bottom of the creek draw for one you're going to hear the creek. You're not going to be able to get your sound out um, and it's really challenging. I like to be at least midline on the mountain if I can, if not like three quarters. I like that three quarters range. Where you're not on the ridge top like every single other person, but you can kind of, you know, drop down, hunt, hunt a half mile on this side, top out back over the ridge, drop off the other side, kind of bounce back and forth. Um, so use the topography to your advantage. And then time of day for us, um, you know, in the morning we're covering as much ground as fast as we can, just because those elk are on their feet, they're making a lot of noise. Uh, chances are they're going to respond. It's middle of the day, that's when things start slowing down. They're gonna be bedded. We're gonna slow down and we're gonna, you know, take our time and really kind of dissect like, okay, this is a bedding area as we're coming into it. We got the wind right, let's slow down on our calling. And it may take a little while. That bull might have heard you for quite a little ways come in and then all of a sudden 
he he'll fire off and you know sometimes if you go in there too fast it's like whoa what the heck's going on you'll blow them up out of their bed but our favorite time to call a bull is in that midday and then weather we're looking for clear weather low wind i'd rather have it 70 80 degrees during the day uh high blue sky than have it overcast rain um, or snow or anything like that during archery season calling so um wind is a killer that's yeah co- go ahead cody sorry yeah wind wind is just a killer it's it's they can't hear you you can't hear um if you're in timber it's really tough to to know what's going on and hear that it's, it's definitely a big challenge so um I'd, I'd rather have some calm weather um and it's predictable too on those you know when it's hot during the day those elk are going to be on that north side be on a bench they're going to be tucked into their little hidey hole uh in those cool pockets so i'd rather i know then i know where they're at when it's raining they can be kind of anywhere and everywhere it's tough to get the sound out and uh and it's hard for us to film so for sure yeah i was just gonna add a couple points and then i had one question for you on this but um so my very first archery bowl ever it was middle of the day i at the time had no idea why this bull was bugling at us i think we you know, we, we made some noise or something. We're shuffling down. We're trying to be super quiet and a bull fired off and it was like noon at the time. I was so confused. Like why we haven't heard a bugle in four hours. Why is there a bull screaming at us right now? So, um, you know, working with you guys and figuring out you guys call in, I would say, what is it? Most of your bulls probably midday. Like we yeah, found most I, success yeah, midday. But, between 11 and two, I think we've killed probably 70% of our elk. I would guess. Um, that's that's impressive. And I would say 70% of the hunters are probably back at camp or sure. not putting in the same amount of effort, you know, during those hours, like for years and years, I would get up super early, try and locate elk, you know, by the middle of the day, it was time to like take a nap and have lunch and hang out and regroup. If not go back to camp and sleep in the, the tent or, you know, a camper or whatever your situation is. And you guys are finding the most success when most of the hunters aren't even in the woods listening or, or trying to call. So I think that's a, a huge, huge point to take away from this. Um, and then my one question I did have is when you are doing the cat road shuffle, how often, how much time are you letting it pass from like that soft cow calls to the asterisk to the, you know, ramping it up? So I would say early in the season, we're definitely more patient because we've had bulls come in silent so it's like you know you don't know what direction they're going to come in as long you know so if you got the wind good you know and you've got a pretty good you know at least 180 aspect of where they can come in we're going to chill a little bit but we're not patient in the same essence like i i would say at most is going to be a 10 minute deal and then we're moving on but the, i think the thing for us a lot of times like we're also listening for sticks to break we're 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 not just listening for an elk to bugle back or to hear a cow, um, you know, and, and we've heard bulls start raking, like he didn't respond to a bugle, he didn't, hasn't bugled yet, but all of a sudden you'll just hear a bull, you know, get up out of his bed soft. And as you're, you're calling, you're setting that scene of what's going on, he gets a little bit more intense and all of a sudden 10 minutes into it, he'll finally crack off with his first bugle. So um, I think it's one of those use all your senses there um, not just hoping to hear a bull bugle. And like I said, in the midday approach, that's when we're going to slow it down. We're going to cover less ground um, at, at the speed. And we'll we'll just really just act like a herd of elk that's, you know, went down to water and they're moving back up to bed and whatever else they're, you, it's all about as natural as, as, as possible. So. Awesome. Yeah. Good, good stuff there. Um, all right. So you get a, get a response. Now what it's like for us, high five, like celebrate the hardest thing about elk hunting is finding them. I think you can spend more time just trying to figure out where the elk are than you are actually hunting them. So enjoy that moment. Like take it all in. If this is your first town or the, I mean, even for me, like last year, we had a period of time in the early part of the season. I think I went three or four days without hearing a bull bugle. I was like, when finally I heard one, I'm like, are you kidding me? There's elk here. <laughs> so, um, anyways, that that's one. The next thing to do, I pull out, pull out the phone, grab on you know, Onyx, and pinpoint exactly where you think that sound is. Um, you know, if, if you don't know exactly where it is, okay, give it a little bit of time. 
if you're with multiple people, spread out. Don't all stand right next to each other. Give yourself 10, 10 yards or 20 yards apart. And you never know how that sounds kind of, this is the hardest part, especially about hunting Roosevelt's. It's really hard to pinpoint it. The sound might be bouncing off a, a draw over here. And next thing you know, like the bull's over on our left, but we hear his response over here on the right. So kind of pay attention there, but mark a waypoint so you know where that bull is and use, you know, use your best guess. Like, okay, well, there's a bench. He's down there. He's probably a couple hundred foot about above the creek. Looks like a nice bench right there. I'm sure that's the direction and like confirm with your hunting partners. Like, is that where you think? Yep. Uh, we do the same practice turkey hunting when we hear a gobble. So um, the next thing is time of day, assess the situation. What are the thermals doing? Is it the mid morning, you know, like at 10 o'clock, it may not have switched yet. The wind's still kind of funky. Um, it's gonna dictate how, how fast we're gonna move on this. Are they up feeding or are they bedded? And uh, I think this is a lot of times I hear people like, yeah, I got on a bull at daylight and he, I, every time I bugled, he was just pushing his cows away. Well, what's happening is those, that, that lead cow is going to bed. She doesn't care about you. She's, she's on a mission to go to bed, not necessarily the threat of that uh, other bull that he, they hear. So, um, you know, you want to keep them in earshot and don't give up on them. Like if you hear one, like be, be in the best physical shape that you can to keep up. They got four legs, huge lungs, it's really hard in, in some of this tough terrain uh, hunting in the Rockies to keep up with them, but do your best and maybe figure out on a line like, oh, they're going to go up over through that saddle. And it looks like on that north face, they're going to bed in that bench and try to figure that out. So you, then you can do that midday madness. If they're bedded, then it's like, OK, what's our approach look like? Can we slip in above them? Is the thermals coming up? It's it's now noon, one o'clock. The wind's blowing up uphill pretty good. Um, you know, kind of now, now is the game of, do we come in fast? We slow play this. Um, the wrecking ball doesn't always work. I think a lot of times, like people hear a bull bugle and they just take off after them and they don't even like pause and understand what's going on or assess the situation. And next thing you know, they thought the bull was only a few hundred yards and next thing you know, you blow them up. So, um, and then Taking the bull's temperature, um, you know, is he bugling on his own? Is he, is he, do you hear cows? Do you hear raking? Uh, is he on his feet or is he moving? A lot of times you'll hear a bugle, you know, in that midday and it's just, ooh, and it's just, hey, I'm over here. There's, you know, a lot of, oh, that's just a small bull. It's, it's just a bull bedded, just communicating. You know, your whole thing is you're trying to be, sound like an elk. So don't just all of a sudden, if a bull responds, throw a challenge bugle at them. You've got to, it's a, it's a dance. It's a bit of an art how to get that bull fired up. And so take his temperature. And if he is fired up and things are going, you can make things happen fast. And if it's, uh, he's bedded, it might take a while to get things up and going. So on to the next one there. Dylan. Awesome. Okay. How are we doing on time? Uh, we got about another 15 minutes of like scheduled. We typically, I mean, we can go a little bit over, uh, 15 minutes and answer questions or so, but, uh, we can probably zip through these, um, fairly quickly, obviously hit the, the key things and then we'll dive into, I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, I can talk elk hunting for hours. So uh, <laughs> if I'm rambling on here, feel free to stop me. Um, so on, on what's the wind doing? It's, it's knowing thermals, kind of knowing the behavior of what the terrain is going to dictate how that wind's going to happen. Um, are, are those elk on a sun face or are they on the north face shade? Um, open habitat versus timber. Wherever that sun hits, it's going to pull the, pull the wind. So if you're down on the bottom and that bull's above you and the sun's on that face, you know, you might have good wind in the creek and you're like, okay, it's coming down. But as soon as you step up on that open face, all of a sudden that wind switch at your back and you can blow it up. So really kind of pay attention. The wind may be different from where you are to where that elk is. And I learned this early on, you know, a lot of people like at 500 yards are checking the wind and like, oh man, the wind's bad. But when you get over there, the wind's going to be good. It's like, what is that wind doing between you and that elk and, and trying to predict that? And that just comes into woodsmanship. More time you're in the woods, paying attention to that. I'm always carrying wind checker. 
and, and checking the wind, um, you know, throughout the day while I'm hunting, not just when I hear an elk for the first time, pull it out. So just trying to like mentally bank things and understand what, what things are going on. Um, distance from elk. If, you know, this is like talk through that, like how far apart, I, I don't really get super concerned with the wind unless I'm into that 150, 200 yard buffer. I'll kind of push, push that, um, when I'm five, 600 yards from them. Um, cause like I said, if, unless it's like howling wind, chances are they're not going to wind you, uh, just based on thermals. Um, the next thing is like solo, solo hunting versus having a collar, the communication and movement. It's a kind of fluid setup. Um, when we set up as a caller, um, your job is to be mobile and make that bull come past the shooter, you know, preferably broadside 20 yards. That's what we all dream of. That's what we all try to strive for in setups. Um, if the bull's coming in, you need to be able to have enough distance to move. And, and people ask a lot of times, like, how far do you set up? The terrain's going to dictate how far you're going to set up as a shooter and caller. We're in really thick stuff. It may be as close as 20 yards in the Roosevelt Woods and thick reprod. Um, and if if you're um, in open terrain, you may be 200 yards from your your shooter. Um, it all kind of depends on that. And the dictation is as far as that bull can see is going to be where he's going to stop. So if he can see where that sound's coming from, and he's in in open moderately open timber, and he can see 100 yards. He's going to stop at 100 yards and be like, okay, I knew there's a sound over there. There's a bull. Where are you at? And that'll be where they hang up. So you need to use the terrain and, and ridge features to, um, you know, stay out of where he can see and he's going to want to keep coming. Um, subtle versus aggressive. It all depends time of day. Um, I'm typically going to start real soft and try to get that bull to come in out of curiosity. And it's at the point where if you aggression, this is where, um, you know, if he's fired up, he's got other satellite bulls in the area, you can get aggressive and push on them. Um, calling on herd bulls a big challenge, um, but it's super rewarding when it all happens. And, and sometimes calling isn't the play. And that I've learned over the years, like maybe have the caller stay back three, four, 500 yards if that bull's not gonna come in, but he can keep him vocal and you can, Put the ninja skills to, to work and uh, slip in there and get them killed. So that's uh, kind of the, and the biggest thing is don't be afraid to mess up. I've made a million mistakes. When I make a mistake, it's like, okay, what did I do wrong? What did I learn from it? Um, a lot of people will just freeze. They have a fear of failure and they're like, ah, oh, I don't want to screw this up. And so they don't do anything. And that's the worst, worst decision. Cool. Uh, the, uh, the setup. Yeah. We'll kind of, um, we'll get the key things from this one and then we'll, um, move on here and get to some Q and a, but I mean, there's, there's a lot of good stuff here. So let's definitely cover the, the key points. Yeah. So I think the biggest thing is that the bull's going to come on a straight line nine times out of 10 until things go wrong. That's when they're going to circle for the wind. A lot of times, if you're doing a good job calling, um, anticipate the movement of that bull, they're going to circle for the wind if things go away and they're like, eh, I'm not quite sure about this. So anticipate your movements off of that line of where they would start to circle. You can get a shot. Shooting lanes, biggest thing, use your camo or use your cover to your advantage. Don't jump behind the bush. Don't jump behind the tree. You got to be out in front. Shadow is the key. Be on the shadow side. If you're out in the sun, doesn't matter if you're fully camoed, they step into the inside 40 yards, they're gonna pick you off and it's gonna be over before. So use the shade um, and also clear the surroundings. Um, I prefer to stand, I will never kneel unless I have to, to get underneath some cover, um, but clear limbs around, make sure you can draw your bow and you're not gonna cause a lot of movement there. Awesome, yeah, that's, that's Crucial. I mean, I think that's a really common mistake. I've made that mistake. I look back on several times where you're calling a bull and he's standing there broadside at 35 yards and you can't draw your bow because, you know, you're going to have to take two steps because there's a big brush or a tree in front of you. Yep. So I, I've definitely learned that the hard way. And I think that's a tough one to, to get over because you do feel exposed, but also like 
you know, just like you guys, I've had elk where you're standing in front of a tree and you feel exposed and they'll walk up five yards by you and have no idea you're there. So as long as you're not moving, being, being dumb about it, um, moving in the wrong times, like being exposed, you, you have to draw your bow or you can't kill them. So it doesn't really matter. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, yeah, we'll dive into this one here real quick. Calling the bull into range. So the biggest thing there is calling on emotion. It's introducing, you can hear, as I've talked through some of these uh, sounds, you can make the sound or you can add the emotion into it. And that, I don't know that there's, personally, I don't know if there's a really uh, a language per se, but you know when someone's yelling at you versus when someone's talking to you. And that, that's inflection in your voice when you're calling is, is doing the same thing, in my opinion. Um, and then there's two ways that elk are going to come in. They're going to come in out of anger and they're going to want to fight you or they're coming out of lust. They're there to breed you. So um, the other thing of it, too, is go with what got you there. If a bull is cracking off to an external estrus call, don't think that you need to slip a bugle in there all of a sudden and make it like if he's firing and he's coming, stick with what got you there. You can add that bag of tricks as you get into it and things go array, but um, that that will uh, definitely, uh, you know, the copycat syndrome is the other one. If he's bugling, chuckling, bugle and chuckle back. Um, if he's only chuckling, only chuckling. I don't know what it does sometimes, but it's kind of like you got your, well, in my case, my six-year-old and eight-year-old and they're playing the copycat game. And next thing you know, they're tussling on the ground because, well, he, he said what I was saying, the same deal I think goes into, to elk. So. Awesome. Awesome stuff there. Uh, last slide here before we dive into some cool giveaway stuff and teasers and then Q and a, but yeah, like, you know, like we talked, all this is really great to, to get a bull to come in, but at the end of it, like the goal is to shoot him. So how do you, uh, how do you go about that? Yeah, no. And I think that is, um, it's having the mindset of confidence when you step up, you got an arrow knocked, a bull's coming in. It's like, I'm killing this thing. That That's confidence is key. Even, you know, even if you got to pump yourself up a little bit when you're nervous and, and all that. Um, and, you know, take the time when that bull comes in to execute a good shot. Do not panic. I used to have panic set in and, you know, I've been lucky, killed a lot of bulls over the years. And when it goes down, I'm like, I got super lucky on that one because I rushed the shot. Pay attention to what's going on. Um, we talk about kill mode. It's like, have your shot routine down. Okay, you adjust the grip. Um, I, I like to draw early or often. So I wanna be able to, to, if I hear branch breaking, he's just out of sight, I'm coming to full draw. I'm in my peep. I, might, I have both eyes open, but I'm like ready to shoot the second that bull comes in and stops in my shooting lane. The other side of it, always have a mouth call in your mouth when you're set up he, so you can make that sound. He comes in, meow. if he doesn't bark at him, that, that nervous grunt um, and get him to stop um, and know ahead of time, like, okay, run through either with a range finder, um, no kind of yardages as trees. Okay. That's 25. That, that tree over there is 37. If he comes in between 30 pin, you know, all those types of things have that all mentally planned out. Um, when you go into it and then after you shoot them call they don't know what happened um this was i i guess the scenario they take off and i don't know how many times they're they spooked and then you call bugle at them they stop and you can see blood pumping out of them and they'll tip over right there you know if they can cover a lot of ground in a hurry um the shorter the blood trail the better so call afterwards try to get them to stop um don't just celebrate right out of the gate like it's so critical from the point of shooting it till they're out of sight to like mentally map everything out. Okay, went by that tree, went over this log. It's going to piece together the blood trail much faster. So, yeah, for sure. And the other thing too is just grab a second arrow. Like, even if you don't think you need to or whatever, if you call and that bull stops, like that's happened before where, you know, I've called and the bull will stop, you know, 45 yards broadside again, and then I'm fumbling for an arrow. And so I just, I'm trying to break that habit myself. So like, as soon as make shot, grab a second arrow as I'm making calls and just get ready. Cause you never know. You remember, uh, Ty Stubblefield, why his, his nickname was three arrow. 
because he yep. had shot two bowls literally like the bowl was dead at the first shot but it was like there knock punk knock punk and the bull died right there so um it's it's definitely and and it's one too like you get an arrow in one um that's when i'm going to shoot further than like if you already have an arrow in it you got a slider i'm going to uh, take a follow-up shot to get another arrow in it so for sure awesome well tons of really good stuff there so we're going to tease some stuff right now um before we do a giveaway so we this is live right now you can find it we'll throw a link in the chat um you can also just google onyx hunt elite born and raised and and find it there but essentially what we've done is you know we've been partners and and had a, an excellent relationship with born and raised for many many years even before i was here at onyx and um we finally have teamed up to offer all our elite members some really cool exclusive discounts at your guys's website so that's 20 percent off site-wide bornandraised.com so all the calls cody was just talking about uh the tubes the the reeds the diaphragms everything there plus the meat bags and your guys's merch and everything just site-wide 20 percent off and that is for our elite customers only um so we'll throw that in there and then also we are working with, with the whole team at Born and Raised um, to do essentially what we're talking about here, but kind of take it the next step. So a little bit more in depth, maybe some more situational stuff of, okay, here's, you know, here's video of a bull hanging up and how we overcame that, et cetera. Um, so again, that's going to be a really cool elite out calling exclusive course. Um, it's in the works right now. I just, just previewed some videos the other day. It's super awesome content. Um, some of it we've covered here and then some of it we haven't. So keep on the lookout for that. Anything additional to, to cover there, Cody? No. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's season's coming fast. I, I just encourage you to practice calling, hiking, do everything you can to simulate being out elk hunting prior to. So when you're out there, you're effective. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm excited and awesome. It's just been an honor to work with, with Onyx over the years. Um, you know, Zach and Dylan have become close friends, Eric Siegfried, the founder. Um, it's just a great group of people with a great product. So super excited to, to bring you guys some, some value in this, uh, course. So. Yeah, no, for sure. And the calls, that's a good point. Cause for me, you know, like I, the September one for me is like my go-to if I really want to like throw a lot of sound out there for locating bugles really try and like hit the extra you know quarter mile like that's the one i'll pick up but then the easy cow is kind of my go-to day to day so um you, what's the name of your guys's pack where it's like one of everything uh it's a collection so there's yeah seven seven okay. of them yep and then there's uh, the new blood i is, yeah yeah i would strongly suggest people um to buy the collection and literally throw in you know, each one, cause there's going to be one that you prefer or you make more consistent noises than the, the, the rest. Um, I've got all of your guys's, but again, like I'm usually reaching for the September if I'm, if I'm trying to make locator bugles or just really bugling in general, and then it's the easy cow, but somebody right next to me might say, okay, well, I use this one instead of that. It just didn't work for me. So yeah. um, that's a really good point spot to start. And especially with that 20% off, check that out. And we have a, a basically a, a diagram that kind of shows, um, you know, ease of use and, and volume on them. It's it's a matrix there that you can look at yeah. and kind of show you like where where you might be in the mix of it. Awesome. So um, we really appreciate everybody, you know, sticking on with us. We know it's in the evening, um, taking away time from maybe your family or lots of stuff going on. So we appreciate your guys' time as a, a small uh, thank you. We want to do a giveaway here. So we're going to be giving away some Onyx t-shirts. The link we're going to throw in the chat, um, maybe even a few different times from now till the end. So click on it. It takes two seconds to enter. It's very painless. Um, we're not going to ask you for, for a whole lot to enter there. And then the folks at Born and Raised, um, you guys are giving away, what is it? A set of meat bags, Cat Road Shuffle Kit um, as well. So that's yep. a huge, huge value those meat bags are super awesome. I used them last year for the first time and um, yeah, they're, they're lights out the best meat bags, best game bags I've personally used. And then the cat road shuffle. 
call kit, that's kind of everything, isn't it? That's yeah. Like, yeah if you much. have that, you're pretty much set. Yep, exactly. Awesome. So, yep, check that link, um, get entered, and um, yeah, hopefully you're set up with calls and, and meat bags. So, one other thing, we are doing a backcountry meat care class um, with the folks at Born and Raised again. So, this one is going to be August 9th, same time, 5.30, uh, mountain time there. We're going to cover everything you need to know. Okay, you did all this work you got out there, you called, you executed a shot, you're standing over a bull. And I remember the first time that I, you know, I grew up hunting deer and antelope. I remember the first bull I shot, we walked up there and we were a long ways from the pickup. And it was just like, what did we just do? How are we going to get this thing broken down? It's like 80 degrees. Like, what are we doing here? This is crazy. So um, lots of really cool stuff that we're going to cover with these guys. We'll also throw this link, get signed up. The thing with these master classes is even if you end up not being able to make it, if you sign up ahead of time, we'll email you the next day or the following day, um, the video that we did. So just get signed up, even if you're not hundred percent sure you can make it. And uh, I'm looking forward to that one as well. So that's kind of the, the next step. I'm sure we'll dive into your guys' meat bags and you know, what separates those from maybe some other ones people have seen and, and really get into the meat care. Cause that's at the end of it, super important. Um, so with that, Q and A, um, we've got probably a bunch of really good questions. I'm gonna stop my screen here so you can just see us. And then um, Cody, did you, while I'm pulling up some questions here on my end, was there any that you saw that stood out? No, I'm um, scrolling through is the chat. It was really cool. It was tough to keep up while talking and seeing the chats come through. So I appreciate you guys um, firing away there. And, and, um, there's, um, one here, Matt Elliott says, strange question. I have a severe latex allergy to mouth calls or a big no. Um, what's a recommended bugling setup. So we actually make one read that's, it's called the reason and it's made out of prophylactic and it's not latex. Um, I've heard that that, that has worked. Um, there's other call manufacturers out there that have some, some pretty cool opportunities to, that use silicone read or anything like that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's a tough one to get through, but, um, yeah, we do have that one with prophylactic. Cool. Um, here's a good question because I, I, I dealt with this for quite a while myself is no calling a better strategy than poor calling. I, I, I saw that. Um, I, I do think so. I think, um, I would always use calling to locate. And if you feel like you're terrible at it, um, you try to call a bull in or understand what's going on in the situation, get them to fire up and then put the sneaky feet on and, and slip in there. Um, you know, and a lot of times, you know, if, if you interrupt the situation and he gets fired up, he's going to get the cows up out of bed. Things are going to get active. You can slide in there. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, when are you utilizing a calf call? Is there a particular time where you're like, yep, I need to pull this out of the, the bag right now? Or just how are you utilizing that? It's, it's interesting. I've called in a fair number of bulls that respond to that calf call. And it's usually the rag, rag bull that's like, oh, what's over here? You know, and, and, and if you hear those calves that are lost from the herd, they're super vocal. Um, they're, they're talking loud. They're, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know it, it's. I don't know that I, I definitely narrowed into like when to use it, but um, if you got a bull hung up, we Trevor and I had a case. This is uh, 2008, probably. We had a bull that that we followed for a long time. They went down bedded. We sat up and called for 45 minutes an hour. Nothing. Trevor started getting super loud with this calf call and all of a sudden three calves like literally three calves came to five yards and those that bull came to tow like right into our lap at 10 yards um it's not very common but it's it's definitely one to, to use so yeah i've i've seen that too uh two years ago i we must have sounded like this lost calf's mother or something because we let out a cute a few uh cow calls and this calf, she was super chatty, like every two seconds, just meh, meh, meh. And she walked five yards from me, and there was three rag horns in tow, like right behind her. 
she was standing at five yards. And again, like going back to standing in front of something the whole time in my mind, like as I went to, to draw, I was like, this is going to blow up. She's five yards looking around. We're in the wide open, but it's like, if you don't draw, you can't shoot the bull standing broadside at 25. So what are you going to do? But anyways, long story short, I mean, she came in and she was just going chatting nonstop. And there's three raghorns that were literally just, just puppy dogging her the entire way. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one until then. I personally haven't used that technique, but after seeing that, it was like, hey, it clearly works. Um, what are, we, we touched on a couple of these, but what are some tips for a solo hunter? Do you have anything? I know, obviously using the terrain smart, but. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, for, for me, when in solo calling, um, you, you got it. The setup is going to be the most critical part of it. It's like all of it's going to go along the same lines as all I talked about as a caller and shooter. If you have multiple people, when you go solo, you have to set up and, and be in range where that bull is going to stop and see. So where a lot of times this is where I'm like, I'm going to use the terrain break of a finger ridge and I'm going to set up where that bull's got to come up all the way over the top of the ridge. If I stop, if I crest the ridge, he's going to be able to look, you know, 60, 80 yards and won't be able to see up the ridge. If I get back over the top, he's got to come all the way up over the top and skyline out. So, um, you know, critical points of that. Um, and then two, being directional. When you're in that last bit, like elk, turkeys are the same. They can pinpoint exactly where that sound came from. So like instead the bull's coming in, I'm going to tuck this back. If I got a, a, I'll put my hand over the end of the bugle and really just get that volume a lot so it sounds further than what it is um and then two i got a bull coming in and i'm like i got to make a movement right now i'm gonna stop calling and i'm gonna go as fast as i can as quiet as i can try not to break sticks this is where like people ask when we're in the woods like we're we sound like a herd elk but if i'm solo hunting and i know i've got to get up you know 20 yards to get where that bull is going to come in to get a shot i'm going to go quiet and I might sprint and, and cover that ground and then just be there quiet. Try not to break a stick because it limb pops the same thing as making an elk sound. So, and, and two on back to calling, if you get a bull fired up, I didn't go into this very far, breaking is realism. So um, I, I would, if you can't make a good bugle, can't, you don't have confidence in calling, get one to fire up, start raking or have your collar rake and we've called bulls in without bugling at them. So. For sure. Um, I know you, you have a lot of experience with this one. What are some differences from calling rosies to Rocky Mountain? Um, so my opinion, honestly, is an elk's an elk. Um, Roosevelt's, the terrain's going to be different in them. Um, I feel like I would rather call a Roosevelt because they are more centralized in their home range they don't you know they're not moving four to six miles from from feed to bed they're not going down on the alfalfa pivot and coming all the way up on the mountain to bed on public um, they are living in a small area so they're they're definitely more um uh aggressive and if you get in their bedroom they're gonna fight they're not gonna take off and move as much um but overall the hardest part with roosevelt's is is penetrating some of that thick country. Like I would, I'd rather hunt in rocky terrain, but I'd rather call Roosevelt elk, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it does for sure. Um, most common mistake. I mean, this could be set up calling. Is there one that you're like, man, this is, this is the most common thing that you guys have experienced. Most important is checking the wind and using the wind to your advantage. Like you can sound awesome, but an elk, you can get seen and they can hear you, um, but if they smell you, it gigs up. So paying attention to the wind, I think, is, is the most critical. I had to have two or three wind checkers in your pack on your bino harness. That, that's going to be the most critical aspect. Cool. Um, this one, it's an interesting question for sure. Do you have any tips on calling in cows? Like if you have a cow, a cow permit or a cow tag, anything that works? Calf. Calf, calf, calf calls. Calf. Yep. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Um, it's interesting because I, 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 growing up, like, 
I never had the opportunity to shoot a cow. Like the, my first opportunity was shooting a bull. I've called, I, I think it's, I honestly feel like it's harder to kill a cow archery hunting than it is, unless you're hunting water, I, I think it's another, you know, hunting over water or, uh, you know, an ambush point where uh, cow hunting's a bit easier. For sure. Uh, decoys, do you take them? How often? What kind? What do you like? Great tool. We don't use them that much. Not, um, it's just something else to pack for me. I'm a pretty simplistic guy, but it, it is a great tool, especially in open country. Um, I, I think any call or any decoy out there can be a good one. Um, and I would use it especially more in open terrain like Roosevelt stuff. I, I, I think I'd, I'd leave it in the pickup, um, but hunting some desert bowls or something like that to distract. And it can kind of add realism where you can set up a decoy as a caller, have it 15 yards in front of you or something and move back or have it behind you in that scenario. Or if you're solo hunting, it's like you're moving in, stick the elk butt up, up against the tree, slip up there. It gives a visual confirmation that, yep, that's where the sound came from. Um, so it's, it's a great tool. We just don't use it that much. Yeah, I used one uh, last year. I didn't use it, but the year before I did, and it was one that I, I forget the name of it. Um, it's like a cow's face and you can actually shoot through it. So it attaches to the front of your bow. Um, it worked well. Like it, I think there was a couple times where calling solo, you know, you, you put that up and at least the bull has something to look at. But then I also realized like they're looking that, the decoy is attached to me. So, you know, it's not 15 yards to my right or left that I can get away with some more movement. So, um, yeah, it, it worked well. You can shoot fairly well with it, but uh, I haven't used it a whole lot. But there's there's a lot of cool cool options out there. I know Montana, Montana decoy has some cool options if you want to be like lightweight, the cow butt, um, full side view decoys as well and stuff. So some cool stuff out there to, to try. It's not probably not going to hurt yeah, in most situations. I, I got a question here. I want to congratulate Sean King. His 15 year old daughter drew a tag in Arizona in, in an early muzzleloader. So um, date wise, he, he was asking, would you, he wants to make this hunt really cool and count. Would you approach it in the same tactics that we did during archery? Absolutely the same. Um, we've been down there um, once before Steve had a tag and muzzleloader season was right after bulls are fired up. Um, but also like take note, make sure your daughter's having fun. Like every day, check in. We, are you doing good? The last thing you want to do is come in there. I know you've got a lot of pressure for yourself to perform. Try not to get that pressure to her. Um, we've seen that with youth. Like they, they carry, they're probably better at it dealing with the, oh yeah, I got an elk tag in, in Arizona. This is awesome. Where you're like, holy cow, you have an Arizona elk tag. So just try to uh, have fun and uh, enjoy all the memories you're going to create with her. Awesome stuff. Yeah, good luck on that hunt. A um, couple more good ones here. Do you often or at all use high energy, high energy estrus wines like early in season, end of August, September? Is that too early or are you trying to get them fired up? Yeah, I know like we will do the cold calling deal and, and basically the herd talk. <clears throat> um, I heard this tactic um, silent calling with Jim Horn way back in the day with Primos talked about basically setting the stage of a herds here and you're going to go through a soft you know making all the sounds one bugle two bugle maybe over the course of 15 minutes shut up sit there silent that estrus call could be used in that time um, and you know give it a full 45 minute sit so awesome um Let's see here. I got two more, unless you got some good ones on your end. Uh, what would you expect to see different for this elk year? It's very wet. Colorado is um, usually dry. We've had one of the wettest summers. Would you anticipate elk character, elk changing behavior? I mean, with a, a big moisture year, do you guys see a, a difference in the rut? Is it earlier, later change? You know, it, every year you can count on September 10th through the 20th, like no matter what, it seems like that's going to happen. I think where you're going to get a shift um, early might be a little bit more of a challenge this year, you know, with the, the late snowpack, 
Um, we've seen this with turkeys this year. Honestly, like everything was two to three weeks late in when they were strutting and gobbling. And I, I feel like the ecological cycle of that, uh, ecological cycle of that is probably gonna transfer over into the elk side of life. So I feel like this year, it's gonna be that mid-September to late September when it's gonna be on like Donkey Kong. So I don't know. It's awesome. It's, it's people ask about moon phases, all that. I'm like, get the time off, spend as much time in the woods as you can, hunt from daylight to dark, and leave no stone unturned and you'll get a bull killed. Yeah, for sure. In different areas like I live in Montana, I always have and you'll hear stories, oh yeah, they are going crazy. It's just like Jurassic Park in the woods right now. And then you go out in a different part of the state and you're like, these elk aren't even, they're still bachelor grouped up. Like, I haven't heard a bugle in four days. So it's just, it, it depends. It, it all depends on when that cow comes, the first cow comes in cycle. Um, had a really cool experience with Warb from THP, the hunting public uh, in Wyoming a couple of years ago. We hunted an area from September 1st to the 12th. And it, literally we watched bachelor groups of bulls on day one through the 10th. And then he finally killed on the 12th. And I like every day progressively the rut got more intense and the next thing you know the group of 10 bulls went to five then went to two then went to herds all around and we got to watch this whole thing unfold and it, it definitely was like by the middle of september get in the woods you're going to get 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 on some bulls screaming awesome stuff um do you have any on your end before i just have one more um, no, th there was one here, Brian Hanel asked, uh, we bumped a bugle and bull last year. He didn't spook off completely, but pretty much barked at us for 30 minutes. Tip to this, this situation, bark scream, bark chuckle, like bark, be aggressive right back in him. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're an elk. Like he's confused by what, you know, he didn't wind you. He's, he's confused in that sense of something spooked him, but he doesn't know what, and he's saying, show yourself. So that's what yeah. I, yeah. And I really like to the the note that you had of like emotion behind your calling. It's almost like, no, you show yourself like actually like throwing that emotion in there, I think makes a, a big deal and something I picked up from you guys as well. Yep. Um, last, last question I have, and it's kind of a, just personal one for you is what, uh, what hunt are you most excited for this year? Man, um, I've got a tag in Idaho. Um, Eric Strand's got one and then my best friend, Steve Speck. So the three of us have tags, it's over the counter. Um, really excited to go spend some time in the in Idaho and uh, chase some bugle and bulls in mid September. That's, and on top of that, I do have a trip to Canada for waterfowl. So that's my, nice. that's, that's, uh, that's been a bucket list since I've been a kid, so. Awesome, good thing we have Canada now as elite members, you guys all have Canada, so. Yep. Um, yeah, it makes those trips north of the border a little bit easier to figure out where you're going and where you can and can't hunt and all that good stuff. So, sure. well, cool. I uh, I really appreciate your time, Cody, um, sticking on with us in the evening. It's been awesome. The The relationship is awesome. I love what we have going on this year from the, the elite partnership. Again, if you guys haven't um, already, check out, open up another tab get on your computer check out the elite deal we have with born and raised 20 percent off you know all the calls we just talked about get them in your mouth now not a week before september um get practicing with them and guarantee that they're gonna help you be more successful this year and then uh check out again check out the the meat webinar we have coming up get some game bags because once you put all these calling tactics to work, work and get a bowl on the ground you're gonna need some good uh, game bag. So get those checked out. Any closing closing thoughts, Cody? No, I'm just watching all the comments come through on the on the uh, chat, and it's just it's uh, it's really cool that people took time out to to listen to us talk about elk hunting. I absolutely love it. I'm fired up for this season, and I just uh, reminder: have fun, go out there hard. Um, you know, hunt hunt your butt off and leave nothing on the table. Um, I, you know, people ask a lot of times, like, what's the key to success? And I'm like, putting your time in and, and you learn and things will come together. You get one under your belt and number two, and things start clicking along. And next thing you know, you're, you're a killer every year. So. Awesome. Good stuff. I'm excited as well. And, um, I did see one question. Yes, this is being recorded. You will be able to find it on YouTube, share it with your friends, um, who couldn't make it reference it later for 
man, I, I remember that one section, but I forgot to jot a note down. It will be on, on excellent YouTube. So check it out. And uh, with that, good night. Thank you guys very much and good luck this September. Appreciate you guys.